from uh, Mondo Ice. And the headline, as D read also, is Biden's fanatical pursuit of Israeli uh, Saudi normalization is a dangerous delusion. This piece was written by Mitchell Plitnik, who is a frequent writer for Mondo Weiss. Mm -hmm. But he's not the publisher, who is Philip Weiss. Uh, and there is Biden uh, um, in Jeddah turning to not to MBS. Uh, I don't know who the very tall Saudi on the right is, but mm -hmm. okay, on our right as we look at the picture. But now let's see if they say who he is. He's a rather imposing figure. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. U.S. President Joe Biden gesture as they stand for a photo okay, ahead of the Jeddah Security and Development Summit in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, July 16th, 2022. The photo is uh, via the Saudi Royal Court. Talk of the United States brokering a normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel has heated up again. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan visited Saudi Arabia last week, just days after Mossad Chief David Barnea held secret meetings in Washington with top White House and CIA staff. Those events prompted Tom Friedman, uh, the columnist for the New York Times, to try asserting his relevance again and brought the normalization idea back into the public discourse. Friedman's latest speech on the subject revealed no facts that have not been discussed by many, including this author, for months. But while Friedman might, may have lost much of his stature in Washington in recent years, some older Washington hands, those who are out of touch with the more recent state of play in foreign affairs, still see him as a prime pundit um, on policy. U.S. President Joe Biden falls into that category. <laughs> <laughs> of those who are out of touch with the recent state of play in foreign affairs. And if any of the wild speculation Friedman put out was in any way based on something he might have heard from Biden, it is cause for genuine alarm. And Friedman takes the normalization talks, which are being pressed by the Biden administration, far more than by either Israel or Saudi Arabia to new heights and presents them as a way to not only resolve the current crisis over Israel's Jewish-only democracy, but even to finally put a stop to all settlement expansion. As we will see, Friedman's idea is pure fantasy. Exactly. Yeah, that was kind. He might have said Friedman's idea is pure garbage. <laughs> but if it is even pursued in the smallest way by Biden and Secretary of State um, Antony Blinken, it could make the already horrifying situation for Palestinians much worse. Then he has a title here. It's called An Initiative Based on Fantasy. The chances of a deal between Saudi Arabia, between Israel and Saudi Arabia being consummated are so long as to be almost inv invisible. Yet they are not zero for one reason. 
the possibility that Biden is willing to pay an astronomical price to get the Saudis to agree. Ooh, astronomical price. Astronomical, but the one thing the Saudis have always said is Palestine. You know, Palest a Palestinian state, and that's something Biden, or it, not really Biden, but Israel is not going to agree with. Yes, he must know that. And the Saudis have set the price for normalization so high, it is tantamount to charging a million dollars for a used uh, Honda. <laughs> Friedman listed their demands uh, accurately. First, a mutual security agreement that would commit the United States to come to Saudi Arabia's defense if it is attacked. Oh, boy, who wants to do that? Hmm. A civilian nuclear program, which monitored by the United States. The ability to purchase more advanced uh, U.S. weapons. I guess I have to comment at this stage. Who would want to buy more advanced uh, U.S. weapons if they could buy advanced uh, Russian weapons? Friedman glossed over the fourth demand the Saudis would have. That would be something tangible for the Palestinians that would make a real difference and that Israel could neither renege, uh, renege on nor revoke. While he correctly noted that the Palestinians would be expected to support Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia's normalization with Israel, another unlikely proposition, especially after their fuming at the UAE, uh, the United Arab Emirates, when they entered the Abraham Accords, he expects them to do so for his typically condescending reasons. Quote, truth be told, the Palestinian Authority is in no position to engage in peace talks with Israel today, unquote, he wrote. Quote, it's a mess. Palestinians need to remake their government, but in the meantime, the far-right ministers in Israel's cabinet are trying to absorb as much of the West Bank as they can, unquote. Friedman does not mention how the mess came to be, of the decades of the United States undermining the Palestinian Authority at every turn, uh, no agreement between the Palestinian Authority and Israel ever being worth the paper it was printed on unless uh, Israel could use it for its own ends. That uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority president, specifically Mahmoud Abbas, and the PA have gone along with this and continue to work as subcontractors of the occupation is shameful but it is precisely that which Friedman is counting on. Because without a full resolution that granted the Palestinian their rights and freedom, the Saudi-Israeli normalization agreement would mean they have no leverage in the Arab world left at all. Good point. Yet, even getting to the point where the Palestinian authority would be pressured to give its rubber stamp on a deal it is unrealistic. For one thing, no matter how sweet the deal was for Israel, a real commitment to anything more than a token nod to the Palestinians will certainly lead to the collapse of Benjamin's, Netanyahu's coalition, and he cannot allow that to happen. Down that path lies a prison sentence for the corrupt head of state. Hmm. It should also be noted that normalization with Israel is not the enticing prospect it may once have been. As I reported in June, the countries that entered the Abraham Accords felt an ever-increasing sense of buyer's remorse. A report this week uh, 
um, um, uh, in uh, Bloomberg confirms the regrets the Abraham Accord states okay, are feeling. Quote, this is not part of the vision some in the Abraham Accords had. Israel wanted it as an anti-Iranian axis, unquote. Uh, Bloomberg quotes Aziz al Ghashian, a Saudi analyst who studies Saudi policy toward Israel. Quote, the region is moving in a different uh, direction now, unquote. He later added that the UAE's experience with Israel has made Saudi Arabia more cautious, quote. It realized, okay, the limitations of working with Israel, unquote, he said. And the Saudis have no reason to lower their asking price for the foreseeable future. In terms of principle, they have no more devotion to the Palestinian cause than other Arab states, but they are in a very different position on the issue than, for example, the UAE or Bahrain. Unlike those countries, Saudi Arabia fancies itself a leader, not only of the Arab world, but the whole Muslim world. Uh, many Muslims don't see the kingdom that way. <laughs> but in any case, the Saudis would be crippled by completely abandoning the Palestinians. The Saudis also have time. They already coordinate through the U.S. with Israel on security and clandestinely do business with the Jewish state. They are in no hurry to take this diplomatic step. It carries more risk than potential benefit. As Firaz Maksad of the Middle East Institute put it, quote, this new push for normalization because the U.S. administration would like to deliver before next year is, I feel, divorced from the political reality on the Israeli-Palestinian side. Quibono, who benefits. Mm -hmm. Maksad touches on an important point here. The press for this normalization to happen soon is entirely coming from Washington. Existing mm. Israel-Saudi cooperation works well for both of those countries, and both face significant political obstacles in pushing normalization too far too fast. But Joe Biden incorrectly sees major political gain in a normalization deal. I suppose he thinks that's political gain for him. Yes, he's uh, thinking of 2024. Yeah, I know, but I don't think so. I don't think it's a major political gain for him. I don't either. I think totally delusional. I mean, he's, he's still stuck with the loss um, uh, in Ukraine. He's still stuck with a Europe that's going to be falling apart. He's still stuck uh, with... Uh, basically breaking the deals that the U.S. had with China, greatly interfering with the economic relations of the U.S. and China. Uh, I mean, it still looks like he botched his presidency. Uh, the U.S. has by far the least to gain out of such a deal. Yet Biden is pressing forward with an almost fanatical zeal. His desperation to do this soon can only be driven by perceived electoral interests. That should be a major concern for every American for several reasons. First, every one of Saudi Arabia's demands should be a non-starter. The fact that they aren't is not only a betrayal of everything Biden has said about Saudi Arabia and his foreign policy in general since he was first campaigning for the White House, but also deeply antithetical to genuine U.S. and global security concerns. Saudi Arabia has demonstrated that it will not hesitate to turn to devastating military force to defend its perceived interests. And the result has been the utter devastation of the poorest country in the region. That is Yemen. 
The United States was a willing partner in that effort, but the Saudis re uh, resisted later U.S. efforts to draw down the war, granting that country access to a much higher level of U.S. Weapon weaponry than it already has. It would only embolden an already aggressive Saudi regime. Plus, it will create great pressure on Saudi rivals in the region, um, Iran, obviously, but also the UAE to upgrade their own capabilities in response. Ah, yes, and the Iranians, I'm sure, could get access to Russian technology, weapons technology. Definitely. Especially since uh, the help that they've given to the Russians in the Ukraine war. Now, the Saudi demand for a, a civilian nuclear program is an on-ramp to a potential dual-use program, and it should not be lost that the Saudis are insisting on U.S., not international monitoring of such a program. Oh. Mohammed bin Salman is playing the long game here, recognizing that subsequent American administrations might be willing to allow higher enrichment of uranium and research into potential weapons delivery systems. That means Saudi could become a nuclear threshold state in short order, given the right politics uh, in Washington. Okay, the demand for security pact that would, like NATO's Article 5, commit the United States to defend Saudi Arabia in the event of an attack against it is an actual non-starter. It would require a treaty-level commitment, and Congress would never agree to it. Even Israel doesn't enjoy that kind of commitment from the U.S. Still, the fact that it is even still being discussed is a worrying indicator of just how much of the U.S. interest Biden is willing to sell out here. Biden is not only playing with U.S. interests here, but also global ones. If he were to agree to any part of the Saudi demands... He would surely expect them to pull back from their growing relationship with China. Israeli journalist Tal Schneider suggests that, quote, what the U.S. really wants is a complete severance of the growing ties between Saudi and China and between the Saudis and the Iranians. Well, this may not be as central to Biden's thinking as the potential electoral benefits he thinks he'll get. It certainly plays into his generally belligerent approach to China. It is very much in line with Biden's approach to foreign policy to reverse the reduction in tensions in the Gulf that the Chinese deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia recently created. <clears throat> that it would greatly increase the possibility of conflict in the Gulf would be of little concern, apparently. <laughs> Even all of that isn't the most irrational part of Biden's behavior. Okay, the political gain he apparently thinks he can win if he accomplishes his goal is simply not what he believes it to be. Um, but Democrats have created a situation where Biden, the deeply unpopular incumbent, cannot be realistically challenged in a primary election. Excuse me. Between the party's refusal to hold debates and the pressure on Democratic politicians to essentially anoint Biden, the nominee, the only challengers are two outsiders, specifically Marianne Williamson and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who cannot muster the sort of political and financial backing to challenge Biden in a primary campaign. I don't know if I would be too sure about that, because the antics of Robert F. Kennedy in recent days in support of Israel are obviously aimed at getting continued large-scale support from the Adelson fortune, from Sheldon Adelson's wife. Mm. I think that's what's behind there. And that's what explains also uh, the very tight alliance that Robert seems to have made with uh, Shmuley Boteach, Yet Biden polls in a virtual dead heat with Donald Trump 
a, a worrying figure since the oddball electoral system in the United <laughs> States generally requires Democrats to win the popular vote decisively in order to win the electoral vote even barely. Hence, Trump's election in 2016, despite losing the popular vote by a decent margin. Yeah. As I recall, he lost the popular vote to Hillary by 3 million votes. And still what? Something like 306 to what? To 240 or something like that. Yeah. As a result, Biden feels he needs to find every political edge he can. Biden believes Israeli-Saudi normalization will win him votes and backing. Who will it win him votes? I have no idea why he thinks that. Yeah, I mean, he's already got a big majority of the Jewish votes. So he's not going to get any more Jewish votes. No, I'm not just going to go along party lines anyway. Yeah, I don't you know. know. I mean, I don't see what he figures he's going to get from this. I don't either. He's wrong, and the reasons are obvious. While Israeli Saudi normalization would certainly be a foreign policy win for him and a positive, the harm it would do to the Palestinians is unlikely to register for the vast majority of Americans. Uh, while it would be a positive among supporters of Israel, they're not going to change their allegiance much because of it. Biden, of course, already has the support of liberal bias, of liberal Zionists, and the casual pro-Israel Democrats and centrists. But the pro-Netanyahu sectors, even those who might support a hard line, but stop short of the extremism of the current government, prefer Republicans. Not because of a specific policy, but because Republicans support Israel's repression of Palestinians and it's generally aggressive and hubristic uh, stances. Huh. Uh, that is true, but I think he's overlooking here uh, once again that if Biden should do that, he would probably cut off or make it impossible for Robert F. Kennedy to get substantial financial support from those very Republicans, which I think so far he's been beginning to get. None of that will change because of normalization any more than it did with the Abraham Accords. Trump's conclusion of that deal didn't move the needle and neither has Biden's support for the deals. For the vast majority of Americans, Palestine and Israel are not voting issues. And for those for whom it is, they are committed to one side or the other. Biden is frantically trying to subvert American interests, even as they are defined in cold geopolitical terms for delusional gain. Mm -hmm. And it is that you know, delusional thinking that should be concerning all of us inside and outside of the United States and uh, the Middle East. So, D, what say you? You know, it's just so frustrating. It's frustrating. Because, first of all, he they talk about a two-state, wanting two-state. There's nothing in that that Biden is saying a two-state. There's nothing in that. And it's also, uh, it's just so backward thinking and I think a lot of it has to do with the one part when they mentioned about China and some trying to um, get so the Saudis away from China and to try to have the havoc that was there before uh, there's no way that's going to happen I know it, do it doesn't make because sense the to Saudis evidently got close to China in part because of Biden's, uh, his initial hostile foreign policy to Mohammed bin Salman, but also uh, the success of the Chinese in brokering the Iran deal. And certainly that success came about because the Chinese 
most probably promised the Saudis incorporation into the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. which they must uh, you know, have greatly desired. Uh, okay, I think especially after Biden's initial um, um, hostility to MBS, uh, most probably MBS concluded, uh, I don't want Saudi to be completely dependent on the United States anymore. Mm -hmm. I want a situation where I can play off the United States mm -hmm. against China continuously. I'm sure he's decided on that kind of foreign policy. And so Biden can't get him to completely come over to the United States side. There's nothing the U.S. can do to make that happen. No. And Biden doesn't get that. He's living in the past. He's not living in reality. Yeah, I think I'd prefer the second phrase to the first one. He's not living okay, in reality. He hasn't been living in reality for a very long time. If he had been living okay, in reality, he never would have gotten involved in uh, Ukraine. No. He would have stayed out. He would have realized it was impossible for Ukraine to beat uh, the Russians or even to give them serious trouble. He and his advisors completely miscalculated on the economic side of the conflict, mm -hmm. thinking of Russia as, uh, what do they call it, a gas station or something? I mean, that was ridiculous. It's very ridiculous. Oh, this dog barking. It is. He just. I just don't understand the thinking of this administration. Of this. I think they greatly overestimated the power of the dollar. They used that from the first as a weapon to try to get people in line. And all that produced was a deep desire on everybody's part to get rid of the dollar and to not be dependent on the dollar. And that's now a worldwide wish. And everybody has a determination okay, to get rid of the dollar. And you think that would have... Everybody's thinking right now. It's part of everybody's plans. Exactly. You think he would have been on board with the fact of how do we work things out with people, you know, and do something along those lines, noticing that the de-dollarization thing is the issue. He's just, it seems like he's always off someplace else. You know, the world's going in one direction and he's just off somewhere else. Not in sync to what's going on. Yes, and we're seeing another example of this here. Yeah, but where is Jake Sullivan? I mean, he seems to be driving this also. What the hell does he have in mind? I don't know. And then, you know, when you say about the Mossad, you know, was there beforehand talking to the U.S. and Saudi's not going to go along with this stuff. And, and, and everybody knows that. So it's just a bunch of a waste of, of everybody's time. Yeah, well, evidently the Mossad doesn't know it. Because they seem to be involved here, too. Yeah. So why are they so unrealistic that they think that somehow the Saudis are going to get back in line? I don't get it. You know, they, it's, they have their own reality there, too, in Israel. We notice that when we read the Jerusalem Post and the Times of Israel. Yeah. Uh, uh, the only way anything can happen there... Okay, if, if, if the Israelis were to agree to implement the two-state solutions by getting the settlers out of the West Bank and by doing it immediately, and that would require a fall of the Netanyahu government. Oh, definitely. 
because no way that's going to happen with the Netanyahu government in power. So it's almost as if the Mossad is really serious about this, 